Good evening. I know that many of you who are listening tonight have grown up on farms and have experienced at some level farm life. You know what it is maybe to grow your own food or de be dependent on what you have to grow in order to live. A lot of you have uh, grown animals, raised animals for food as well. And you know what it is to have to slaughter those animals. You know what it is to have to cut the heads, for instance, off of chickens. And you know the phrase, probably better than most, and I've experienced this in my life as well, the meaning of that phrase, to run around like a chicken with his head cut off. Yeah. When you cut the head off a chicken, often that chicken will run around without a head for a couple of seconds until it capitulates and finally falls over dead. Well, think about that for a moment. That chicken body, and I know this is a funny illustration, but that chicken body lost connection to the head, didn't it? The control center, the life. And though for a brief moment there was some activity, there was movement, there was function. Where there's no head, there's no life. Where there's no head, there's no life. Well, that seems, like I said, kind of a funny illustration, but the Colossian church was being influenced, as we've seen in the past weeks, by a lot of different teachings which didn't belong to the gospel of Christ. Many of those people had followed those teachings, uh, even to the point to those teachings and philosophies to the point where Paul says in this passage, they've lost connection to the head. They're not connected to the head, to Christ anymore. And where there is no head, there can be, as I said, no life. No life. In our case, where there's no connection to Jesus Christ, the head, there can be no real life. Where there's no relationship, there's no real life, no real motivation. And this passage shows us very clearly, Colossians chapter 2, 16 through 23, what happens when there is no relationship to Christ the head. I know most of you have heard the term legalism at some point. What comes to mind when you hear legalism? Well, it's not a term that we find in the New Testament, although the concept is found quite often in the New Testament, in the letters and in the Gospels. Uh, when we think of legalism, what kind of people come to mind, especially in the Gospels? You remember the Pharisees? Well, that's probably the most vivid example that we have in Scripture of, of legalists. Pharisees were legalists. They felt that keeping their long lists of minute laws is what made them special in God's eyes. Uh, it was that outside, that external law-keeping that kept them, however, from neglecting the insides, what God really was looking for. Well, looking for a good definition of, of legalism is interesting. I want us to, to look at a couple of different definitions tonight. The first one being, uh, and I quote, treating biblical standards of conduct as regulations to be kept by our own power in order to win God's favor. Okay, let that sink in for a moment. Treating biblical standards of conduct as regulations to be kept by our own power in order to win God's favor. Well, in other words, it means I strive by my own strength, my own power to be ethical, to be good enough to please God, to earn my salvation, basically. There's no real relationship. There doesn't have to be. There's no real connection to the head. There's simply a list of rules. I have to follow them. God wants it that way. That's that thinking. That is so very dangerous, isn't it? Uh, when we live like this, we become no better than the, the Pharisee in the temple. Do you remember when the Pharisee and the tax collector went to the temple in Luke chapter 18? I think that gives us a vivid example of what happens when we live legalistic with a legalistic attitude toward things. Let's read that passage together. Luke chapter 18 beginning in verse 9. We'll get there. Listen to what Jesus says. To some who were confident of their righteousness and looked down on everyone else. I'm going to stop right there just for a very short moment. Confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else. I don't know what you've experienced in, in church life or dealing with 
other Christian people throughout your life, but I've run into this a lot. Confident people who are confident of their righteousness and look down on everyone else. We're more righteous than you. We're the only ones going to heaven. We're saved. You're not. You have to be so careful with that. Well, Jesus goes on and it says, he told them this parable. Two men went to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector back here. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all I get. You see the problem? This fellow had fooled himself into thinking he was so righteous before God because of all the good things he had done, all the laws that he had kept. Well, it is a huge problem. The tax collector, on the other hand, who had failed miserably in life, and he knew it. That was the difference. He throws himself on God's mercy. Verse 13, but the tax collector stood at a distance He wouldn't even look to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you the truth, this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. I think that illustrates more clearly than probably anything else the result of the idea of legalism. Well, that idea took on a whole new level with the Pharisees. Not only did they keep all of those laws of Moses that Moses had given to the T, they added a lot more to them, hundreds more minute laws to them out of the standards God had given them, as we've seen on Sunday morning in the past five weeks, those things that mattered to God. Out of those laws, commands, those words, the Pharisees made the hundreds of additions. Hundreds of of additions to the standards that God had given them. Well, listen to this additional definition of legalism. Erecting specific requirements of conduct beyond the teaching of Scripture and making adherence to them the means by which a person is qualified for full participation in fellowship. Wow, we think about the the Pharisees and how they had done that, the Sabbath regulations that Moses had given that were so important to God. They took on a whole new level with the Pharisees. There were hundreds of additions to those laws, little tiny minute things that you could do or couldn't do on the Sabbath day. Tithing took a new level, where it used to mean giving a tenth of, of what you had. Well, they went to the extent that, well, it meant giving a tenth of all of your herbs and spices from your garden. And through all of that, arrogance and self-reliance and self-righteousness took on a whole new level. Listen to this short version of legalism uh, given by a writer by the name of Cami Harris. A legalist believes that their good works and obedience to God affects their salvation. Legalism focuses on God's laws more than relationship with God. It keeps external laws without a truly submitted heart, and legalism adds human rules to divine laws and treats them as divine as well. I would add to that, I would add to that, that legalism is like cutting the head off the chicken. Without a relationship to the head, there may be a lot of movement, but there's no life. And there was a lot of religious movement in the lives of Pharisees. But what did Jesus say to them? You're like whitewashed tombs. Inside, you're dead, dead, dead. Well, let's look at our text in Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and following. Please turn there with me. It's so much easier when you've got the text in front of you and can follow along in that way. Colossians chapter 2, beginning verse 16. I'm going to read. 16 and 17 first. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. What comes to mind when you read those things? Uh, Eat, 
re judging someone by what they eat or drink or uh, religious festivals, new moon celebrations, Sabbath days. Those were all things that were involved in, in Jewish life. They were all things that the Jews knew. Well, didn't Paul, hadn't Paul made that clear just in the past verses that, that God canceled through Christ, canceled that written code that was against us, nailed it to the cross, did away with it. Well, some people were still stressing it. Not only that, some people were still judging other people by their adherence or non-adherence to that law or those laws. Not only those laws God had given, but those unwritten or written laws that the Pharisees had added to that. Well, let me ask you this. Are food and drink and keeping of certain days more important than others grounds for judging others even today? I have to think about Paul's examples throughout the New Testament of eating meat sacrificed to idols, 1 Corinthians 8, 1 Corinthians 11, Romans chapter 14, where that was a real problem, a real issue. And Paul makes it clear that there's nothing wrong with eating the meat. The meat is fine. It's meat. God gave it to us to enjoy. The problem lies in our attitude uh, to those who had a problem with eating that from a faith standpoint, or those we could add to that who abused their privileges, their freedoms that God had given them. Well, maybe drunkenness would be another example. Look at how often drunkenness comes up in those lists of sins that, that we read in Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament. Drunkenness is often addressed in Scripture. Drunkenness is the abuse of something that comes by nature, isn't it? The abuse. Think about gluttony. How often do we read about gluttony in Scripture? Food's good, but overeating it to our own health demise, the demise of our own health, is wrong. Is wrong. It's the abuse that is so often attacked in Scripture. Well, read through Paul's dealing with people throughout throughout Scripture throughout his letters, and it is often that abuse that Paul condemned. I think about the words at the end of Romans, uh, that treatise in Romans chapter 14, uh, verses 13 through 17, and I think we need to hear those words in this context. It's in the context of weak, the weak and the strong, chapters 14 and 15, but listen to what he says, verses 13 through 17. Therefore, let's stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or a sister. I'm convinced, Paul says, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that's important, that nothing is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person it is unclean. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you're no longer acting in love. Do not, by your eating, destroy something or someone, rather, for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what you, not let what you know is good be spoken of as evil. The kingdom of God, he says, is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Can we cause others to stumble by our practice? practicing our God-given freedoms? Absolutely. Absolutely. This is what Paul is stressing. Well, should we judge one another when they practice their God-given freedoms? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Those Jewish laws in the context, Paul says, were mere shadows. Paul says, when you got the reality, the shadows go away. Think about it. When you follow a shadow, uh, if you keep looking down at that shadow, you're eventually going to bang into the reality, aren't you? The shadow goes away because you found the reality. And in this case, those were shadows, those regulations, those laws. We have the reality now, the fulfillment in Christ, all the fullness. We've, we've seen that. Paul is basically saying, having him, having Jesus Christ, therefore don't let anyone spoil you by involving you in some kind of me uh, mechanical performance that cancels out the reality.
performance as a way of earning our salvation or relationship to the head. Well, think that one out. The next section that we read there may have a reference to the Gnostics or some group like uh, those who would later become known as the Gnostics. Let's Let's read those. Don't let anyone, verse 18, who delights in false humility, the worship of angels, disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they've seen. They're puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They've lost connection to the head. Puffed up. Wow. False humility. Worship of angels. Visions. Oh, I've seen an angel. An angel spoke to me. Uh, and they grow and go into great detail about what they've seen or what they've heard. And it puffs them up, just like that Pharisee in the temple, puffed up with idle notions about their, uh, by their unspiritual minds, by their own unspiritual mind. Yikes! <laughs> there were some who were so arrogant about what they knew and about what they had experienced and about what they had seen that they influenced the others around them. All of those extras, Paul says, all of those things, you don't need those. You've got Christ. What more do you need? Well, there was an ascetic uh, aspect to this whole thing. I'm convinced, reading in verse 23, such regulations, well, do not handle, verse 21, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use are based on merely human commands and teaching. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgences. In other words, all of those extra laws and the adherence to them and judging others uh, who don't maybe adhere like we think they ought to, well, it looks good on the outside. It looks righteous, doesn't it? It's not. It has an appearance of wisdom, but it's not wisdom. It's not wisdom. None of those things, Paul says, do any good to restrain those sensual desires uh, and in, uh, sensual indulgences. Well, there's a lot more we could say about that passage, but what's the takeaway for us? I say, in a, I would say in a big way that we need to realize we too can fall into the trap of legalism. We can make laws where there are none. We can turn Christian traditions into laws that determine fellowship even. We can fall into the trap of judging others on the basis of those laws. And we can fall into the trap of thinking that our personal adherence to those or any laws somehow makes us more righteous or better or more pleasing to God. And we can also fall into the trap of false humility, which is basically Christian self-centered arrogance in disguise. Paul makes it clear. He says in verse 20, since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why do you submit? Uh, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Why, if you died to those things, why do you still live like it, according to those rules? Why do you still act like you belong to the world? you got to let them go. We've got to let them go. And maintain our connection to the head, because without him, all our good works, all our religious strivings are nothing more than, than an empty actions that tend to make us arrogant and proud of ourselves. Instead, stay connected. Stay connected to the head. What a difference things are when they're motivated by relationship and not by performance. What a difference uh, in staying away from the abuse of things God's given for our enjoyment. Uh, I consider my freedoms and their practice uh, based on my relationship to Christ. I consider them based on my relationship to Christ and my relationship to others in the body of Christ uh, when I have a relationship to him and to them. Isn't that what he kind of says in verse 19? They've lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God calls it to grow. This is part of spiritual Christian growth, isn't it? Staying connected to the head in a relationship with him, casting off 
legalism and judgmental attitudes, helping one another through all of these things. Now, I know you've heard this line before, but if I do things for my wife because I am trying to win her affection, chances are that's going to go awry, isn't it? But if I do it because I love her, because of my relationship to her, then the motivation is completely, completely different. All of us know the passage in Galatians, or in Ephesians, rather, chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, where Paul says, It is by grace that you've been saved, through faith, and it's not f from yourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. That Pharisee could boast, couldn't he? Because he thought he had earned his righteousness by doing all of those great things. All of these people in the context, whether they were Jewish legalists or whether they were Gnostics or philosophers or whatever, could boast because they thought they were being good by all of their good works. Yeah, living legalistic lives is a danger for Christians because doing so denies the power of God to save us uh, without all of the good works that we try to do. And living legalistic lives does nothing, Paul says, to, to defeat those desires of the flesh. God's power is all that can help us to defeat those. Paul says, you've died with Christ. Died to living like that. Died to that old life that really was no life at all. It's interesting, the next section, beginning in chapter 3, verse 1, says, Since then you've been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. It's like he progresses to the next level, isn't it? You've died with Christ. You've raised with Christ. Live like it. Live like it. What a practical chapter we're going to look at next in, in chapter 3. I hope you'll join me next week as we continue in that. Again, if you have any questions or feel like you need prayer or you would like to respond to this in any way, I pray that you'll, you'll call the office, that you'll write me a note, uh, come by if you need to or, if you, or, or want to, and let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Thank you.